gentlemen, um, I am Trisha with Insectopia, and today we've been going through my collection, right? So we've been going through things that I collected over the last, um, over the last, well, year, but then some of my really old specimens that never really got sorted back into my collection. Um, and today we're going to be looking at the Hymenopterans, alright? So we're going to be looking at the bees, the wasps, and the ants. Um, some characteristics that they all have, all bees, wasps, and ants, they're going to have, as adults, they have four wings, a front wing and a hind wing. Um, they will have chewing mouth parts, that's something ever, they all have, let's see, or kind of lapping mouth parts, but they all have the ability to chew. Yeah, some of them sting, some of them don't, right? So we'll be going through, we'll be going through them. I was trying to think of other characteristics for the order, but um, I think that's about it. Um, we are going to be looking, ooh, gotta set up the microscope. We are going to be looking under the microscope to check out some of these characteristics, um, just like we have in the past. Um, and the first... Uh, the first family that we're going to get into are the Sarissids. So, hello. Make sure it's not underlined. Alright, so we're going to be looking at the Sarissids, and the common name for them is something that I always forget horntails. Derp. So the first, um, the first time an after or the first wasp that we're going to be getting into are the horn pails. So these guys generally, as their as their characteristic, as their as their name says, they're going to have this long horn or spine at the end of their tail. Let me get a unit tray. So the so the horn tails are generally going to be fairly large wasps. Um, and if you look, this one's all tucked in, but if you look at the end of its abdomen, how it looks like it has a really, really long stinger. Let's see. There you go. It looks like it has a really long stinger, but that's actually an ovipositor. So it's an egg laying device and it's not going to be able to sting or stab a person. Although... It is what they get their name from. So let's look at that under the microscope. Doop, doop, doop. <laughs> Gotta get the microscope set up. Oh, this. There you go. Alrighty. So um, right here we're looking at the end of the... Um, we're looking at the end of the abdomen of our of our horn tail, and you can see that it has this. Um, you can see that it has this kind of spear-like, I guess, um, end of its abdomen, and the female is going to have this long ovipositor. So all of the horn tails are going to have this kind of spear-like on the end of the abdomen. And this is the ovipositor that she's going to use to help lay her eggs. <laughs> awesome. So the horn tails are going to be pretty easy because they have a horn on their abdomen or a, or a tail on their abdomen. So those guys I figured we'd start with because they're easy enough. So, um... Do only the females have the horn tail? Good question, Kathy. Um, so if we are looking at if we're looking at the the males and the females, the males and the females are going to have the horn tail, but only the females are going to have the ovipositor. So 
Um, if we're looking down here, this is the ovipositor, this long black, um, very, very obvious kind of spine. That's the ovipositor, and that's going to be what the female uses to lay her eggs. But the males and the females are going to have, they call it a spear-like protuberance, you know, but it's just this spear on the end of the abdomen. Thank you for joining us. All right, so the next one that we want that I wanted to get into are the um, are the ichneumons, and we do move pretty quickly through the families just because there's a handful of them to get to. Now, okay, so the ichneumonidae are also called the ichneumon wasps, and these guys. have their characteristic is in the wings all right so if we're looking at the wings of an ichneumon we're going to be looking at a characteristic horse head that can be found in the wings let's check it out So this is going to be our ichneumon wasp. Sorry, he uh, lost his antenna at some point in his life. All right, let's see. Maybe I, maybe I turn it so that he's facing up. All right. So as we are looking at the ichneumons, we're going to be looking at the wing venation. So right here. People say that that looks like a horse head. So if you can see, it kind of looks like a neck, and then up here is the head. It has this kind of upside down boot shape in the wings. And all ichneumonids, or most, most ichneumonids are going to have this horse head shape. All right. So if you were going to find, if you were going to look for one characteristic on ichneumons that's easy to see, I would pick this one. Um, and we can look at it on a, and we can look at it actually on a handful of different specimens. Um, the thing with ichneumonids, the thing with ichneumonids is that they are actually the largest family of hymenopteran, right? So even though um, most of the most of the wasps that we see are vespids, and most of the and a lot of the bees that we see are apids. The ichneumons are actually the most diverse or the uh, the most speciose family. Sometimes wing venation is a little bit more difficult to see just as um, because you're looking through the wing. But you can see here we've got this vein and the vein up and then here's our nose of the horse, right? So that's going to be our horse head. Now there's another family of wasps that are very, very closely related to the ichneumons. All right, let's get that horse head information on there. All right, so the other family that's gonna be very closely related to the ichneumons are the Burkhanids. All right, so Burkhanids are also a parasitoid wasp. We're also going to be looking at the wing venations for them. I don't have a Burkhanid um, with me, so we're not going to be looking at them under the microscope. But I just want to say they're very closely related to the ichneumons, but they don't have that horse head on their wings. All right, they tend to be a little smaller than the ichneumons. Um, and when I get a Burkhanid specimen, I'm sure I will be able to add to this. Now, I also don't have very many micro hymenopteran right now, um, but I don't know if you've heard of the Chelcidids. They are a small, very, very small hymenopteran that tends to be, um, they tend to be parasitic on, um, they tend to make galls and plants, um, and they have this really, really cool hind leg. 
they're very, very small. So the Chalcidids are going to be super, super tiny wasps. I don't think I've ever seen a large one. Turn it so everyone can see it. Perfect. All right. Now, with the chalcidids, we can see this one is female. She has that ovipositor sticking off of the end of her abdomen. So right here, that, that this is going to be her ovipositor. Um, and with the chalcidids, we are going to be looking at the hind legs. So we've got the first legs right about here, our second legs right about here, and our third leg third pair of legs, or the hind leg, there we go, is right here. You see how bulbous and large it is? The femur of the chalcidids are super, super enlarged, so it almost looks like they have jumping back legs. It almost looks like they have the legs of an orthopteran, right? So it looks like they've got these huge femurs and these little tibia and their little itty bitty toes. Right, the little itty bitty tarsi. Um, and so that's gonna be our characteristic for the family of Chalcidids. They're gonna have these hind legs that are um, expanded hind legs that almost look like jumping legs. All right, and I add that to the dictionary, perfect. So those are going to be our Chalcidids. Cool. All right. And there are a number of these guys. They can be really cool. They can be kind of black and yellow striped. I've seen them. All right. Now, the Specity. They're also called Specid wasps. All right, these guys are going to be, these guys are their common name. They have a handful of common names. The specids have a handful of common names. This one is going to be called the thread-waisted wasp. So we can look at it on the pin really quick so that you guys can see. Um, if you look at, there's the head, the thorax, and then you'll notice that the abdomen has a very, very, very thin waist, right? They almost look thread-waisted, right? So that's going to be one of the, one of the sight characteristics. You can kind of see that they have that very, very thin thread waist. Um, but if we were looking at a specid under the microscope and trying to identify it, trying to um, differentiate uh, a specid from other wasps. Yeah, make sure that the leg's not in the way. This one I wanted to get set up a little bit before I showed you her. Perfect. All right, so right here we are looking at, this is the side of the head and the thorax. So this is the side of the head and the thorax of our, of our specid, of our thread-waisted wasp. And we're going to be looking at this lobe pronotum. So let's give you a couple words so that you guys can, can see this. So we've got a head here, all right? This first segment of the thorax on the top, this is called the pronotum. The pronotum in a lot of, in things like cockroaches, actually guard and shield the head. Some pronotums, um, like in the membracids we saw, can be cool shaped. This guy's just got this very small pronotum right behind his head. It's kind of triangular, except you'll notice that right here, you see this kind of lobe. This is a lobed pronotum. 
All right, and this is going to be the one of the characteristics for sphesids. They've got this lobe on the pronotum, and it doesn't reach. You see this little thing right here? That is called, doop, doop, doop. That's called the tegula, right about here. And that's going to be guarding, it kind of guards the connection for the wings. All right, and so we're looking at this lobe does not reach the tegula. That's going to be your characteristic for sphesids. That's a very, very specific one, right? It's very difficult to see unless you're looking at it under a microscope. Um, but that's the one, that's the characteristic that if you see, you can define it. Now, um, when I was learning hymenopteran in school, the sphesids and the crebronids were taught together, but they have been separated. So um, we're going to say the pronotum lobe not reaching tegulum all right so the specids both have a threaded waist and this pronotum and this pronotum that doesn't reach the tegula Tegula. Derp -derp. Okay. Now for the Crebronids, the Crebronids used to be the Crebronids used to be inside of the family of Sphesids. So they didn't used to be separated. But nowadays they do, entomologists do like to separate them. And the crebronids are the sand wasps. So these guys, these guys are, doop, doop, doop. let's see, who do I want to show you? Let's show you this guy. I guess the common crabronid that you would recognize is this guy right here. He's a cicada killer, all right? So a lot of you might know about cicadas. They're super loud. They chirp in the trees, right? Um, and you might notice these large wasps flying around them. Well, these guys like to sting and paralyze um, they like to sting and paralyze uh, cicadas, and then they'll bury them in the sand. Um, that's why crebronids, although they're called um, cicada killers one type, they're called sand wasps because generally they'll, um, they'll sting their prey and then they'll bury it in sand. All right, and if we are looking at, and if we're looking at the characteristics on, hey, switch over. There we go. And if we're looking at the characteristics on the crabronids, they're going to have the one characteristic that we looked at on the side of the specid body, the crabronids are going to have it too, which is one of the reasons why they were lumped together back in the day. So this is the side of the head, and then... Um, you can see the pronotum is here, and it has this lobe. This is the lobe that we are looking at on the specids. I want to get this into focus a little better. There we go. All right, so we've got our head. We have our pronotum. This is that lobe on the pronotum that was characteristic for specids, but is also characteristic for crebronids. All right, so they also have this pronotum lobe that does not reach um, the tegula. But if we look at the entire body of this wasp, we'll notice that the waist right here in between the thorax and the abdomen, 
um, this waist right here is very, very narrow, right? It's not a long, thin waist. These, these wasps tend to be kind of bulkier, kind of heavier. They kind of look like tanks. <laughs> I don't know how you guys want to call that. We can call it a shorter waist, or we can call it a kind of like a thicker waist. But that's going to be our, but that's going to be, this guy's a cicada killer. We have a couple other Kerberonids if we wanted to look at them. So we'll notice that its body, so we'll notice that its body is fairly, um, is fairly stout, right? It doesn't have that really narrow waist. And if we zoom in on, here's the head and the pronotum, we'll see that it has, here's the lobe. We'll see that it has the lobe and the lobe doesn't reach right here. This is the tegula, the thing that's guarding the connection of the wings. Hello. So I'm glad I have people out there watching. Um, is there a bee blast for ant that you're more excited to see? Okay. So we have our Cabronids. Now, um, outside of the sand wasps, like the cicada killers and stuff, we also have some really, really beautiful hymenopterans. I would say um, the Helictids are some of the prettiest, and I think they're some of the prettiest family. Um, they are the sweat bees, and they tend to be metallic. All right, so they tend to have these really, really beautiful metallic colors. Let's check them out. Hi, friend. So this, wow, she's so pretty. All right, this is a sweat bee. They tend to have these metallic, a lot of times they are metallic green, um, but they can be a variety of other colors. Um, let's zoom in on that. So helictids use a structural color instead of a pigmented color. So they're never going to lose these colorations on their exoskeleton. Um, what I mean by a structural color is that um, pigments tend to fade over time like dyes. But um, structural colors are color that is built like a crystal. So the, um, the, way that, the reason that you're seeing this metallic green is because the light's actually bouncing off of small crystalline structures on the body, which is also what get, makes it metallic. Now, um, if we, we could just hang out and look at the metallic colors, but that's not going to give us the characteristic for the family because... Um, there are a handful of different bees and wasps that are going to be this to be metallic and have structural structural colors rather than pigmented colors. So the character that we're going to be looking for in the family is actually in the wings. Very good. All right, so if we are looking at a helictid or a sweat bee's wings, we want to be looking at what they call the submarginal cells. So this here, this is the marginal cell or the cell that's on the margin of the wing, right, on the edge of the wing. And then submarginal would be the ones underneath it. Okay, so we have helictids have one, two, three submarginal cells. All right, that's characteristic for the family. That's something that you can look at, and all helictids are going to have. They have three submarginal cells. And then 
there is there is another so um, there are many 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 families of Hymenops right and so sometimes the characteristics sometimes the characteristics you've got you can't just have one right so they tend to be metallic they have three submarginal cells and because adrenids also have three submarginal cells they call this the M, the marginal, the M vein. So we'll show you that. All right, so we've got these three submarginal cells, one, two, three, but also this vein right here, it has a really pretty, beautiful arch on it. All right, and so if you have three submarginal cells and an arch, you know it's a helictid. Um, there are other families that have the three, but then this, this, um, this vein is straight, straight across rather than arched. And it sounds like you're kind of, it sounds like you're kind of splitting hairs with these small characteristics, but this is how you tell them apart because they are, they do look so closely, um, they do look a lot alike. All right, so we've got the three submarginal cells and this arched M vein. I think they're so pretty. So um, Justin Schmidt, I I don't think I can make it through the. I don't think that I can make it through the entire live stream without giving a shout out to um, Justin Schmidt. He is the guy who wrote Sting of the Wild. He gets stung by bees, wasps, and ants across the world, all over the place. Um, and he actually came up with his own pain scale called the Schmidt Pain Index. I made a video, I made a short YouTube video about it, so you can go and check it out. But he describes um, being stung by a sweat bee like he calls it fruity um i think it's this thing that feels like a single hair um got uh like caught on fire or something got singed so the um so the sweat bee doesn't have a very very strong sting but um but they do have the ability to sting and justin schmidt talks about it in his book The leaf cutter bees. I don't know if you have ever gone out to your garden and noticed that there were perfectly circular cutouts of your leaves. I don't know if you've ever gone out and seen that, but um, that's what that's what leaf cutter bees do. So we've got the megachylid. These are going to be um, these are going to be the leaf cutter bees, and with them, let's get it underneath. There is a male and female characteristic. So the female's characteristic is going to be easier for me to show you, I believe. Let's get this started. Uh. All right, so with the megachylids, I wanted to show you the scopa. So that means I'm going to have to take off the labels. Give me a moment. I've got to flip this flipper upside down. So you'll notice, um, you'll, you'll see I just did something kind of strange. I put, uh, I put museum tack on my microscope. This is to help hold my pin upside down while I show you the scopa.
right, so this, we're going to be, we're looking at what we call a scopa. All right, so the females are going to have what we call a scopa on the underside of the abdomen or long hairs that they use to collect pollen. <laughs> yeah, Justin Schmidt was a curious guy. I'm seeing your guys' comments. Um, I gotta say, I've met Justin Schmidt on a couple of different on a couple of different times, and every single time I've I've met him, whether we are in the summer in the middle of the desert, or whether we are like winter up in Oregon, he is always wearing shorts and open toed sandals. He wore open-toed sandals in the desert, guys. That blew my mind, but I mean, he is trying to get stung, so I guess that makes sense. <laughs> All right, now on my mega chylids, on my leaf cutter bees, they've got these long hairs on the underside of the abdomen. All right, we call this the scopa, and this is where um, mega chylids, or leaf cutter bees, store their pollen. So if we think about, um, if we've ever seen a honeybee flying through the air, you'll notice that it has the pollen basket on its leg and it holds all of its pollen on its hind legs. Well, um, leaf cutter bees don't use their legs. They actually use the entire underside of their abdomen. So you can see all of these really, really long hairs on the underside and they're on every single abdominal um, segment. And so that, is going to be where they hold their pollen and a characteristic for all females, right? So only the females are going to have scopas because only the females go out and collect pollen. The males don't do that work. All right, now um, we like to talk about the submarginal cells. We like to talk about submarginal cells in hymenopterans. We'll see them a couple times today. So if we are looking at the, if we're looking at the wing venation on a megachylid, yes, they have the scopa, but let's see. We call this cell right here the marginal cell, right? This is the cell on the end. And then the submarginal cells are these two. So um, megachylids, or leaf cutter bees only have two submarginal cells. All right, so those are going to be some of your characteristics to get you to kind of help you identify the megachylids. Now, um, for me, when I see one, this is this is a very common species. So I actually have have three of this species in my collection. I've caught it a couple times over the years. They always kind of seem like really heavy bodied bees. But they do have but they have to be they have to carry leaves and stuff to their homes. Cool. Mega chylids. All right, now, the, um, the family that you're going to be probably the most familiar with are the aphids. Let's see. I have to get the, I had to take the labels off of my megachylid to show you the scopa. So I'm going to get the labels back on before we move on to our next specimen. It's really important to be very careful with your specimens, too, because they are so incredibly fragile. Mega chylids. All right. Let's get to the aphids. Let's see. So, these are... Bees? <laughs> um, I know there's lots and lots and lots of different kinds of bees, right? Because we've already talked about sweat bees and leafcutter bees. 
Um, but with aphids, we are talking about these are your common everyday run of the mill bees. Um, an example of one of an aphid would be a honeybee. All right. Um, these guys, we're going to look, but I'm going to type all of the things ahead of time. Um, honeybees. Honeybees are going to have three submarginal cells. Um, just like our sweat bees up there, except that these guys are going to have the M vein being straight. All right, and so these are the two that we were just talking about, making sure that, making sure that yes, it has three submarginal cells, but we're going to have to go one characteristic further and check that out. All right, and then they generally have. Um, they generally have their scope on their hind legs, or they call it a pollen basket. All right, so we'll be able to go and check all of those characteristics out on the honeybee. Hi, friend. I just think that, I just think looking at insects under the microscope is kind of the coolest thing that you can do all day. All right, so we're going to be looking down here at the wing venation. All right. So this is the marginal cell. This is the top one. I promise you that it does end way over here at the end. It's just not on the screen right now. So this is a complete cell. It, the aphids or the honeybees and the other common bees uh, have three submarginal cells. One, two, three. All right, right across. So we know that. But then when we're taking the second characteristic, we're looking at the M vein, which is right here. It connects the submarginal cell down to this vein. And you'll see that it is very, very straight. All right. Apids have three submarginal cells and have a straight M vein. And that is your characteristics in the wing and how you're going to be able to identify these guys under a microscope quickly. Um, these characteristics are characteristics that I learned over the course of time as I was, you know, keying things out, but also taking exams in school and stuff and trying to find the easiest kind of characteristics. Um, that are going to be common on most specimens in the family. Now, my honeybee actually still has some pollen stuck to its leg. All right, so we're looking at the hind leg here. Um, maybe we can, maybe we can level it out so that the focus isn't so wacky. There we go. All right, so right here we are looking at the hind leg. And this right here is actually a large chunk of pollen that is still stuck to the hind leg. I think that that's really cool. I would never clean these off. I think that you can actually um, sample this and determine what types of flowers and things that the honeybee was sampling from, which is kind of cool. All right, and so this is going to be where your pollen basket is. You can kind of see how they have these really long hairs around it that's sticking out, um, but there are also hairs that are up in that that are helping um, hold the pollen to the pollen to the leg, right? And so with leaf cutter bees, those long hairs are on the bottom side of the abdomen, but in um, bees and honeybees, it's on the hind leg. All right, aphids. All right, the next guys that we're gonna get into are the tephids. Hey, I think, I think the tephid was the bug of the day 
today? Ooh, I don't think that the answer is out yet. Hey guys, you are gonna be um, every day on, um, very frequently on Facebook, I do this thing called Guess That Bug, and I take microscope pictures and I post them, and they're very close, kind of um, just a single characteristic photo, and over the course of the day, I add more pictures to the same insect, and then I have people try and guess what it is, right? I have a lot of fun with it, and there's a couple people on there that are really good. They're always guessing the right families. Um, I believe that this specimen is the mystery insect today. So you guys have already have, you guys have are going to have a step up. And this characteristic is a character that is on the underside of the body. So I just made sure to take the labels off, getting the specimen all set up before I get you over there. All right, so we're going to be talking about Tiffiety. All right, so the Tiffiids, um are just called Tophiid wasps, so I'm not going to write their common name there. They have a very, um, that's, their, their common name is based on their scientific name. Alrighty. If we look on the underside of a Tophiid, Tophiids are one of my favorites because they are, um, they are super, super easy to identify because they are literally the only hymenopteran that has this characteristic. So if you see it, you know it's a tophiid. And that is right here. Right here. So um, we have, what do they, how do I, how do I describe, how do I describe, how do I describe what I'm seeing? <laughs> They're triangular mid -coxy. I think we got this. All right, so right about so right about here, we have these triangular projections off of the um, between the between the middle legs, right? So you can see right here we have one kind of triangular projection, and we have here we have another one, and they kind of project down in between the middle legs. And tophiids are the only hymenopteran that have these. All right. And I honestly, I don't even know what they're for. So if anyone out there knows what they're for, I'd love to hear. <laughs> um, so right about here, they've got this kind of triangular piece. And right about here, and they're the only wasp that has them. Now, tophiids tend to be kind of a, a longer bodied a long kind of thin bodied wasp. All right. Um, they do, they will have um, black and yellow stripes, but not all of them do. Um, the other thing that I notice about tophiids is that they have kind of this odd shape to their abdomen. A lot of times um, bees, wasps, and ants, they'll have like, um, their abdomens kind of, it feels more complete, more full. To feeds, they have what almost looks like a rubber band holding each of their, um, each of their abdominal segments kind of tight. I don't know how to describe this. <laughs> Imagine, hmm, what are these called? It's almost like they're, it's almost like each abdominal segment has kind of like a rubber band in between it. So they, uh, I'm going to draw. Words sometimes, guys. A 
lot of um, a lot of hymenopterans are going to have an abdomen that's like this, where it's kind of full and the segments kind of evenly go into each other. Whereas to phaeids, their abdomen feels a lot more like this, where each of the abdominal segments kind of has a constriction at the end. And so when you look at the end of a tephid, you can kind of see that you've got this um, constriction here, and then you've kind of got a constriction at every abdominal segment and kind of lobes that way. Now, um, the other kind of nifty characteristic on tephids There we go. The other kind of cool characteristic on tephids is that they will have this upward pointing spine on their abdomen. All right. Um, I believe it's the males. I believe it's the males that have this. Don't quote me on that. I believe it's the males. All right. So the tephids have the triangular projection between the middle legs is going to be the characteristic that you can look at every single time. Um, these other characteristics were just kind of cool to look at on these guys. The constrictions on the abdomen and the hook on the end. And that cool hook on the end. Alright. Who wants to look at his face? I do. Awesome. Okay. Put the feet back. All right, so we've got we got the tefids taken care of, and we are moving into um, this next specimen is a scaliid. All right, I'm gonna have to take I'm gonna have to take the labels off of this guy too. We're gonna be looking at the hind coxae, but also at the wings. So I'm going to show you the wing characteristic first because it's easier to see. I'm going to I'm going to write these guys down. So the um <laughs> and then All right, so I'm going to scroll down a little bit so you guys can see this. We're looking at the scaliids or the scaliid wasps. They are going to have the a hind coxae, so their their hind legs. Um, the coxae are the base of the legs. So the hind coxae are separated, and then the edges of the wings, they kind of look like fingerprints. That's a characteristic that one of my university professors showed me, and I, I love it. I think that this is cool. So, if we're looking at the if we're looking at the scaliids and we are looking at the at the um, ends of the wings, all right, <laughs> all right. If you are looking at the ends of the wings of a scaliid you'll notice that they have they'll notice that they have all of these very very fine lines or very very fine um, folds in their wings on all four of them you can see it a little bit on the hind wing here this is a front wing this is a front wing and they definitely look like fingerprints guys um, this is one of the characteristics. If you see this, you can kind of narrow it down into thinking that it's probably a scaliid, right? 
Um, they're not the only wasp that has them, but it gets you it gets you a characteristic that narrows it down pretty well. All right, so the edges of those wings they look very very fingerprint like. And then if you flip the specimen over to look at where the hind legs, um, to look at where the hind legs connect, and focused. The legs and the antenna and everything are all kind of down there in the way, huh? Alright. So I always imagine, imagine the coxy of a leg as kind of like the hip bone. Alright, so... If we're looking at, we've got the front leg is way up here, this is the mid leg, and then this is the hind leg. All right, I'm going to try and describe this the best I can because there's some characters that are, so their antenna and the legs are kind of in the way. But um, you'll see this is the femur or the first segment of the leg, and right here, this is what we consider the coxy. All right, that's where the leg connects to, it's kind of like the hip and connects to the body, right? That's the coxie number one. And then on the hind leg, the other leg over here, the coxie is way over here. Now, frequently in bees, wasps, and ants, those are actually touching each other very close to the center where like the coxie are right next to each other and then the hind legs separate off from there. But you'll notice in scoliids, the coxae are separated, right? So there's all of this space in between the two hip bones, or in between the two coxae, that help you identify this to family. All right, so that's the characteristic we're looking at for scoliids. We really want to make sure we flip over our specimens and look at where the hind legs connect into the body and make sure that those coxae are nice and separated. That's our goal. Does that make sense to everybody? I feel like scoliids can be, um, I have seen them misidentified as flying velvet ants because they tend to have very velvety bodies. So we are closing, we're closing in on, we're closing in on our families. Let's see, we got our scoliads done. We have four left. All right, we've got four families left, and that means we're probably going to go until like 2.15, or uh, 3.15, 3.20. All right, the next one we're talking about are the mutilids. The mutilids are also known as velvet ants. I'm sure that a number of you out there have seen velvet ants. Um, velvet ants tend, to, a lot of people think that they are ants, right? Whereas they have very long stingers. Actually, velvet ants can, um, their stingers um, come out of their abdomen and then they can sting directionally. All right, so their stingers actually have joints in them, which can be a little bit scary. I'm going to grab a specimen that hopefully the characteristic's going to be easy on. Let's see. We'll try this guy. Now, velvet ants. Uh, 
Um, velvet ants have this kind of velvety fur on them. So they look a lot like an ant, except that if you saw it, you would think that's really, really fluffy or that's really, really um, hairy or furry, right? Now, um, the velvet ants, if we were going to be looking at a characteristic outside of just like kind of that gut response of like, that is a very furry wop ant, um, we're going to be looking at what they call the, um, the felt line. Alright, so this is this is an I believe this is a photopsis or a or a, or a nocturnal velvet ant. It's one of those velvet ants that actually came to my black light. Um I think that, that I think that it's the coolest when when things that you don't expect show up at a black light. seeing if another velvet ant has this characteristic any okay this one this specimen has it it's a little bit more clear so we'll show you it on this guy I've got a handful of velvet ants I do enjoy collecting them alrighty so when, where, where is the felt line, Trisha? Where are we looking? All right, so this right here is the body of our velvet ant. You can see that it looks a lot like an ant, except that it's super, super fluffy, right? But we want to be looking on, they call it the metasomal tergite, right here. Okay, so we are looking right here at like what appears to be the first segment of the abdomen. Okay, and... There we go. You'll notice, you see this kind of line right here? <laughs> All velvet ants are going to have this kind of, this. they call it a felt line or a line of thicker hairs on the top of their abdomen. All right. If it doesn't have this felt line, you're likely looking at a winged scoliad and not an ant. All right. Um, so this is that. So that's the characteristic that you're looking for. Outside of knowing that um, their their coxae are close to each other, so they are going to be touching, um, unlike the scoliids, and and they've got this felt line, and they all have it except sometimes the felt line is a little bit more difficult to see. Um, and that is just because they tend to have so many, they tend to be so, um, cetose or so hairy that, um, they tend to be, it tends to be a little bit more difficult to see, uh, a line of even more hairy spot, right? But this one seems to be pretty obvious. You've got that nice little felt line right there. Um, so if we were looking at this other specimen that we tried to see it in the first one, let's see. I honestly think that this leg is in the way. The felt line should be right about here. Silly legs. Now, my favorite mutillid, I'm going to show you my favorite. This next mutilid, this next velvet ant, actually has a little story that goes with it. I was in New Mexico. I was in New Mexico 
and I was wandering around the desert looking for cool bugs. Check this out. All right. I was wandering around the desert looking for awesome insects, trying to figure out, um, you know, trying to find something new and different. So scouring the ground. And then all of a sudden, this ball of fluff, this ball of cotton seems to be kind of rolling in front of me. All right. So it almost appears to be like a seed pod or a little ball of cotton. And it's moving across the ground so fast. And I'm thinking, it looks like it's blowing in the wind, except that there's no wind. And so I get down really close to this insect and see that it's this nifty velvet ant um, that is called a, I think it's called like a cotton down. I've forgotten its name. Anyway, I found this really nifty velvet ant that looks like a seed, um, kind of looks like a little bit of cotton or a seed as it's going along the desert. And you'll see right here, that is its stinger. It died with its stinger out. It's incredibly, incredibly long. And directional. Okay. So we have our mutilids. There are three families left. We're going to be talking about the pompilids or the... Um, or the tarantula hawks. We're going to be talking about the vespids, or essentially yellow jackets and wasps. And then we're going to be talking about ants. So these three are pretty common, pretty um, popular. Pretty common and popular families. So pretty. All right. All right, so the pompilids are known as the spider wasps. The one that we're going to be looking at today is a tarantula hawk. This guy was collected in Texas this year. He's had a couple of boo-boos, so you may, you may or may not notice that he's got a little bit of glue on his antenna. I tried to keep him together. He just, uh, he just didn't want to be together. <laughs> All right, let's see. Pompilids. So I'm trying to put this into English. Uh... Which is going to be a character that's going to be difficult to see on this specimen. All right, so I'm going to tell you a story about tarantula hawks as I'm trying to find a character, uh, which guy would be easiest to, to see on. Uh -huh. All right, so tarantula hawks are awesome because they will sting their prey, which is a tarantula, right? They have the ability to sting a tarantula and paralyze it. All right, these are big wasps. They actually rate um, the highest on the Schmidt Pain Index at a 4.0. These guys, they hurt if they sting you. And when they do sting tarantulas, they have the ability to paralyze them. They also have the ability to tr completely drag a tarantula across the desert and bury it in the sand. They'll lay their eggs on the tarantula. They'll lay an egg on the tarantula and the baby wasp eats the tarantula while it's alive, all right? So it, the tarantula's paralyzed um, and can't move, and this baby wasp just starts munching down on them, all right? So um, as uh, if you are in the American Southwest and you see a huge wasp that, is, that has orange or black wings and has, is, has a metallic black or blue body, you are likely looking at a tarantula hawk. Okay. If we 
we were trying to find the actual characteristic of pompilids to identify them and um, confirm that they're a pompilid and not anything else. So we are looking at the side of my tarantula hawk, all right? So we're looking at the head up here, my thorax, he's got this first leg, and he's got his middle leg. And the characteristic that I wrote on our notes, right, is that he has this suture or this line across the base of his middle leg. And what I'm talking about is right up here on the side of his thorax. I was having a hard time um, coming up with an English way of saying that. Right, so this is the mesipimeron. Mesipimeron? Right here. And if you'll notice, a lot of the wasps, a lots, of, lots and lots of bees, wasps, and ants are going to have this, but they're not cut in half. So you'll notice right here, My nematology teacher says if you if you imagine it, it's there. No, I see it. It's right here. So if you look, um, if you look, this is the uh, kind of the base of the. This is the coxy, and this is where the coxy hits the thorax. And if you look right here, it's got this suture that splits the mesiapomeron in half. All right, that's the characteristic for the family. That's how you can identify all pompilids versus other wasps. All right, tarantula hawks aren't the only spider, um, aren't the only spider wasp, um, because you'll notice, because there are pompilids all over the United States, and there are not tarantulas all over the United States, yeah? So there are pompilids that attack, so there are pompilids that attack spiders, but there are also pompilids that attack things like, um, crickets and grasshoppers and katydids, right? And they'll do the same thing. They'll they'll um, they'll sting their prey, and then they'll paralyze them, and then they'll lay an egg, and the babies eat the eat the prey. Vespids. I was actually helping somebody on Reddit recently identify some vespids. A lot of times, so when we're talking about the Vespids, these are kind of like the basic wasps. Kind of like the Apidae were kind of like the basic bees. Um, Vespidae are the basic wasps. So any of these kind of yellow jacket type of wasps, the paper wasps, paper wasps. That's a better, better term for them. All right, any of the paper wasps, the characteristic is the D cell. And that's not a battery. All right, so this is a paper wasp, right? Or a yellow jacket. You guys might call them hornets. Um, this is one that I'm sure you guys have all seen lots and lots and lots of times, right? You guys have seen Vespids around. You guys have seen paper wasps. Now, if you are looking for a characteristic that Vespids have that nobody else has, you're going to be looking at the wings. to show you on this specimen and then we're going to switch over to a bald-faced hornet so that you can see it on another specimen too because the wings on this guy are a little folded up maybe we can go to the other wing the wings are a little folded up and it makes it a little bit more difficult to see oh that's better Okay, now if we are looking
looking at the wasp of, or at the wing of a paper wasp, we want to be looking at this really, really long cell right here. This is the D cell or the um, herpeter. The distal cell. So this is the D cell right here. And in vespids, in wasps, it's incredibly, incredibly, incredibly long. You can see that it is very, very, very elongate. And all wasps are going to have this. Um, you'll notice the wasps fold their wings over their body and they kind of fold their wings right up And I think that this kind of helps with that. It gives them a it gives them a place to fold their wing kind of in half um, So all vespids or all paper wasps are gonna have this very long expanded D cell And we did get to see it in her We can look at it again on we can look at it again on our bald-faced hornet There it is. Um, so you see that this is the end of it, and it goes all the way about here. All right. So that is an incredibly long cell for um, for a wing. <laughs> cool. All right. So those are the vespids. And then the final family we're going to be looking at are the formicids or the ants. All right. Now, I think that 90% of you out there, if you saw an ant, you would know what it is. And you wouldn't have to look under a microscope to find a characteristic to say, aha, that is definitely an ant, right? Um, or say, that's kind of the same with paper wasps, right? If you saw a black and yellow um, striped paper wasps, you definitely know it was a wasp and not anything else. Let's see, get it, grabbing an ant. Let's grab this one. He's fun. All right, but... If we were looking for a characteristic that all ants are going to have, um, they're going to have what we call nodes in between the um, metasoma and the abdomen. Now, And so what I mean by that, those nodes, um, they're going to be right here on the waist. So let's check them out. And then it's lunchtime. I'm trying to get, sometimes, sometimes ants get their legs in the way, and I know you're supposed to point ants. So, you are supposed to put ants on paper points and not put the pins through them. These were specimens that I pinned a little while ago. Okay. Um, the metasoma is generally what looks like a thorax, right? And this is going to be your abdomen back here. And on your waist, in between, in between those two segments, Ants are going to have nodes, or these kind of these segments, or these lumps in between the segments. So you've got one, two on this guy, um, but we also have, let's see, I think this ant will be a little bit more obvious, hopefully. It's hard to see. Let's try this one.
I think that first specimen was actually going to be your best way to see it. Um, so you can you see how this is the thorax and this is the abdomen. So this is kind of the, wa the waist that connects the two. And in ants, they're going to have nodes or these kind of um, expanded segments in between. Um, sometimes, sometimes the nodes butt up right against the butt up right against the abdomen, so they don't look separate. But they always are in ants. Um, and a lot of times, people will, if you're looking at an ant in your home. If you're looking at an ant in your home, sometimes people get ants and termites confused. So I just want to point this out really quick. Um, if you're looking at an ant in your home and you see that it has wings, you say, wait, both ants and termites can have wings. How do I tell them apart? You can look at the antenna. So ants, ants are going to have these elbowed antennas. So the antenna starts here, comes up, and then comes over. It has a 90 degree angle and looks like an elbow. All right termites antenna don't have this angle they are gonna be beaded along the way so a termite antenna almost looks like a string of pearls whereas um, an ant's antenna looks like an elbow all right that's gonna help you um, separate your ants from your termites and then your ants are gonna have these nodes back here between the thorax or the metasoma and the abdomen All right, I, oh cool. So um, I have a question, how to resemble um, the queen and the male ant? How do you, how do you determine the queen um, and the male ant? Um, all of those ants, all ants are gonna have those nodes, right? To separate them from everybody else. But if you're trying to determine a male from a female ant or a queen ant from the rest of the colony? I know that queen ants have a larger head. So if we're looking at the head size, the queen is going to have this a head that's about double the size of all of the other males or all of the males. So if you're looking at, let's say, um, a mating flight and you have all of your ants are flying around everybody who is flying around is either a male or um, going to be a queen right or a, or a or a almost a queen right a princess <laughs> um, and the queens that aren't mated those the queens are going to have a large large head and the males are not now male ants always have wings Male ants always have wings, wings, whereas the females don't always have wings, right? So worker ants never get wings, and they're all ladies, they're all females, okay? The queens have wings, but they have a large head, all right? And then the males have wings and a small head. <laughs> so that's going to be how you tell them apart, Gore, and I hope that you answered that. I hope that, I hope that, um... That that made sense and thank you for asking I hope that everybody has really enjoyed their time with me today it's about an hour and a half as it turns out of going through specimens I do have a variety of specimens that I'm still working on identifying and then when I get those kind of figured out I'll be able to show you guys the characteristics um, maybe I'll even do a live key that could be fun um, but this is just an overview of the of the hymenops that I have identified and have organized for the collection, which is exciting. I hope that you've all enjoyed hanging out with me today, and I hope that you do come back. Um, Tuesday is the next live stream, and we are going to be talking beetles. And I have all different kinds of really cool beetles. This is gonna the beetles are going to be really fun to identify because we have so many and I might actually have to break the beetles up into two into two live streams because it might just be too much all right um thank you for hanging out with me today I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and I will see you on Tuesday um from 9 to 10 or next Thursday from 2 to 3
All right. Have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day.